Kia ora koutou katoa, uh, ko Māori Hudson tuku ingoa, no whakatohia. Uh, my name's Māori Hudson, I'm a member of the Whakatohia Nation and I am an Associate Professor at the University of Waikato. Um, I'm really pleased to be a part of this program on AI ethics, uh, providing a global perspective. And in particular, this uh, lecture will be talking about Indigenous data sovereignty. I'll just give me a moment to get my presentation up and we will get underway. So, as I mentioned, this um, talk is going to be about Indigenous data sovereignty. I'm based at the Tikote Research Institute at the University of Waikato. Um, and have been involved with a number of organisations, which I will uh, talk about shortly. My affiliations to Whakatohia, which is a iwi or a tribal nation in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm a member of the Tribal Council there, uh, Whakatohia Māori Trust Board, and a negotiator for their tribal treaty claims. In a professional capacity, I've been involved with co-authoring guidelines on Māori research ethics, uh, genomic research with Māori and biobanking with Māori, I'm a founding member of Te Mana which is the Māori Data Sovereignty Network, as well as the Global Indigenous, Indigenous Data Alliance. Um, I've been a co-author of the Care Principles for Indigenous Data Governance and a co-director of Local Contexts, uh, which is one of the developers behind the biocultural labels and a co-director of Enrich, which is a um, international network based around equity for Indigenous research and innovation as a coordinating hub. So just to start off, I did want to um, talk about the Indigenous data sovereignty in the context of uh, an international environment. Um, and this is a, a movement that has uh, cross, is crossing the globe. There are a number of nation state based indigenous led communities of practice, Te Mana being one of those in, in New Zealand. Uh, but there's also the US Indigenous Data Sovereignty Network and Mayam Nairi Wingara Indigenous Data Sovereignty Collective in Australia, as well as nascent movements um, in Canada uh, and places like Sweden and Mexico. Uh, the Global Indigenous Data Alliance also draws in people from a broader broader set of countries, um, but it's primarily an international network and network. And the Research Data Alliance hosts an international indigenous data sovereignty interest group as well. So what are indigenous data? Um, data information and knowledge in any format that impacts indigenous peoples, nations and communities at collective and individual levels. Uh, this is a slide that was put together by the US Indigenous Data uh, Sovereignty Network. And you'll see there's really these three particular categories. There's data about indigenous resources and environments. There's data about indigenous people as individuals. And then there's data about uh, the collectives as nations and as peoples. And it spans you know, a wide variety of data sets from traditional knowledge right through to uh, scientific data about um, geology or plants through to administrative uh, administrative data collected about tribal peoples. And so indigenous data sovereignty is a new term. Um, data sovereignty comes from cloud computing. It's a, a term that's used to refer to data being subject to the laws of the nation within which it's stored. Um, but indigenous data sovereignty uh, flips that and talks about data being subject to the nation from which it's collected and, and that includes tribal nations. So it's really a discourse about rights and interests in relation to data um, and draws on thinking that emerges from, you know, indigenous rights, treaty rights, cultural intellectual property rights, um, as well as indigenous research ethics and data ethics. And there are two main themes. Uh, one is data for governance. So just thinking about access to data and how that data can be used to support governance decisions. 
in Indigenous contexts. And then as data is available and accessible to everyone and other people access information about our nations, um, what's our role in terms of governance of data? So managing access to data so that its use is relevant and responsive. And just on the right side here is um, uh, the cover of the really the first book that put together talking about Indigenous data sovereignty uh, towards an agenda which was released in 2016. And probably the strongest um, expression in terms of principles as it relates to Indigenous data sovereignty is reflected in the OCAP principles. Um, and this emerges from the First Nations Indigenous Governance Centre in Canada, predates the discussions around uh, Indigenous data sovereignty, but still reflects, you know, ideas of um, Indigenous control of Indigenous data by focusing on issues of ownership, control, access and possession. And in the New Zealand context, uh, we have created, or Tamanda Rodonga has created the Māori Data Sovereignty Principles, taking six common Māori values and concepts and uh, giving them an expression in the context of data. So while uh, Rangatiratanga, um, so Rangatiratanga relates to authority, but it's not necessarily the fullness, the full meaning of, of the Māori word. Uh, but in this context, that's um, how it's being applied. And so, as an example, we can see here Rangatiratanga and authority control. Māori have an inherent right to exercise control over Māori data and Māori data ecosystems. This right includes, but is not limited to, the creation, collection, access, and analysis, interpretation, management, security, dissemination, use, and reuse of Māori data, jurisdiction. Decisions about the physical and virtual storage of Māori data shall enhance control for current and future generations. Wherever possible, Māori data should be stored in Aotearoa, New Zealand. This is particularly relevant at the moment as people are talking about the offshoring of data or making use of cloud data storage options where the servers are based overseas. Uh, and then self-determination. Māori have the right to data that is relevant and empowers sustainable self-determination and effective governance. And if we think about um, the sort of data that's collected and then what you're able to do with that um, in, an, in an AI space, um, having the right sort of data collected is, becomes a, an important component. Similarly, if we think about whakapapa um, and in this context, how that relates to relationships and relationships with and through data, um, 2.1 context, all data has a whakapapa or a genealogy. Accurate metadata should at minimum provide information about the provenance of the data, the purpose, purposes for its collection, the context of its collection and the parties involved. Data disaggregation, the ability to disaggregate Māori data increases its relevance for Māori communities and iwi. Māori data should be collected and coded using categories that prioritise Māori needs and aspirations. Once again, thinking about um, how data has been classified and future uses, current decision making over data can have long term consequences, good and bad for future generations of Māori. The governance of Māori data should be resourced to enable long term decision making in order to minimise future harm. So you can see here that uh, each of these principles is thinking about different dimensions of data as it relates to a core Indigenous concept. And this is important in part because even amongst our own community, there's um, this challenge of competing interests uh, because we both uh, you know, have support for open data and open science, uh, things that push um, data into those spaces. And that comes about in part because of our increasing participation within STEM subjects and cutting edge science and technology as well as our aspirations for Indigenous data sovereignty or greater Indigenous control of Indigenous data. So this goal around, um, or, or a, a sort of a goal uh, sits there around Indigenous communities benefiting from innovation and development, but that coming about by a greater control of Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous data. And you'll see on the right hand side here, uh, the most recent uh, book being released around Indigenous data and policy uh, this came out in late 2020. 
in the discussions around indigenous data sovereignty um, have become more pressing and more relevant as we increasingly move into this era of open data and big data and open science and you know, the use of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to deal with the, with the volume of data that's been um, digitized. And sitting behind that are these challenges where every indigenous community has, you know, large, enormous collections and data held in archives, museums, libraries and repositories. Then significant information about those collections, including community names and proper provenance is often missing. Uh, that those communities are largely not the legal rights holders and therefore often excluded from discussions about um, how they should be managed and issues of responsibility and ownership, as well as the mistakes that exist within the metadata are continuing from the physical environment into the digital environment as that material gets digitized. Um, at the same time, we're not just dealing with the historical collections, but the um, new material being generated through the, res the researchers that are you know, working on collecting data and samples from um, indigenous communities. And this is only increasing as that sort of activity um, increases. So taking a little bit of a shift here and really thinking about when that information and you know, most indigenous data is sitting in institutions or agencies or, or other places outside the control and often the purview of um, indigenous communities. So what sorts of indigenous frameworks can be put together that uh, give some influence or some enhance the ability for indigenous people to make decisions about what's happening with that, with that data. And so what we have here are the care principles for indigenous data governance that were released in 2019. Uh, you can see at the bottom, the uh, reference for the journal article, which has been, which talks about their development. Uh, the photo here is the group of people that were involved in the conceptualizing of the care principles. This was at a uh, conference in Botswana and the principles themselves um, promote collective benefit, authoritative control, responsibility, and ethics as a as a primary um, as the primary principles for this framework, uh, but that it has these sub principles as well. Um, so collective benefit, you know, as in the context of inclusive development and innovation, for improved governance and citizen engagement, and for equitable outcomes, and each of the um, the principles is has a similar uh, has a similar set of uh, sub principles as well. And so the care principles for indigenous data governance in part arose from our evaluation of existing um, existing principles. And when we look at the FAIR principles um, here, the FAIR principles for scientific data management, um, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, are really talking about the characteristics of the data themselves. And so they um, operate as a data centric um, set of principles. And when we did an assessment of uh, Māori data sovereignty principles, the indigenous principles that are emerging in other contexts, um, we realise that they tend to talk more about the people and about the purpose. And so um, the fair principles and the care principles uh, become complementary. And that's how they've been discussed in international forum, uh, particularly the Research Data Alliance, uh, which has been responsible for operationalising or implementing the fair principles and is now becoming a strong advocate for uh, the development of criteria for the care principles and that they be applied um, alongside FAIR. And we're also starting to see um, the, the care principles included in policy documents. Uh, this is the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, IATSIS. They have a code of ethics for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research, which has recently been um, updated You'll see on the right hand side the areas which they think are particularly important in, uh, in the context of this kind of research. Uh, 
and the responsibilities associated with it in the upper left, upper right hand quadrant around indigenous leadership, there's specific reference to indigenous knowledge and data. And if we move into that part of the document itself, uh, you'll see a point there that says researchers must be aware of and apply the international data principles of fear and care. And so thinking about um, this assertion of uh, indigenous rights and interest, which um, is being made through the indigenous, through indigenous data sovereignty, how indigenous peoples become involved in the governance of data um, and indigenous data governance uh, applies to you know, this information that's sitting, uh, sitting within other institutions or, or contexts, and then how people get to access that so um, some spaces that will be a, uh, a sort of an open access protocol, anyone can, can go and um, access it, and other places it will be controlled and it will be um, accessed on request. And so in what ways can Indigenous knowledge inform those data access protocols? And the example which I'm going to talk to here uh, comes out of New Zealand and is based around Ngā Tikanga Paihere. Um, which guides culturally appropriate and ethical data use in relation to the integrated data infrastructure or the IDI, um, which is a database which combines uh, administrative data from a variety of government institutions, uh, which become which is linked and then uh, de-anonymized or anonymized, de-identified, um, and that is available to researchers to apply for apply for access. And the, the frameworks uh, started from some work that we did, which was looking at Māori concepts that inform the sharing of traditional knowledge. And what we were interested in is to what degree might those concepts inform um, ways we might think about data access. And so the, the concepts on the left-hand side here, you can see there's uh, 10 of them that emerge um, through this work really relate to three particular areas. Uh, some of them related to the assessment of the data or the knowledge that was you know, being, um, being requested or, or for th people were thinking about sharing. Part of it related to an assessment of what the purpose of the use of that data was and part of the assessment related to the data users. And so in this um, diagram, uh, the black and blue uh, spirals uh, relate to the assessment of the data. Uh, the green axes relate to the data use and the red axes relate to the data users. And we used these 10 concepts to create a set of questions uh, that showed how they could be relevant to, to data. And so um, we gave each of the concepts a characteristic and you see them there. Tapu, which normally means sort of um, something that's sacred or something that's um, special that needs to be that needs to be managed or restricted related to the level of sensitivity and alongside the characteristic we created an assessment question and the purpose of thinking about um, this in this way is so that we could look at a data set and go um, on balance um, what level of management is required for this data set and if most of the um, answers uh, came up and they were highlighted in the green spaces, then it was probably a data set that could sit in an open data environment. Um, if it was uh, orange, you'd be thinking about, well, we probably need some, um, some rules around it, but they might be uh, sort of policy or practice related um, expectations or rules. And ones that were primarily in the red space um, could still be accessible, but would need to be accessible on request. And that framework or that set of questions was um, used as the basis for developing our tikanga paihere. What we realised is that the 10 questions aligned quite nicely with the five safes framework. That was the framework which Statistics New Zealand was using to inform access to the ID data from the IDI. Uh, the five states framework is also used by other national statistics organizations around the world including in australia and the uk and 
um, that provided uh, the basis for thinking about uh, these areas, which you can see through the uh, through the middle part there in the orange, and the the Māori concepts that span both sides of it. Um, so uh, anyone accessing Māori data from the IDI now uh, currently has to answer questions related to each of these areas uh, to get a before approval can be granted. And so that uh, Ngāti Kanga Pahere framework can see as something that works in a, a sort of essentially in a controlled um, in a cold controlled access sort of uh, situation and we're also thinking about how to maintain um, indigenous indigenous control or indigenous relationships with data which might be sitting in more open spaces as well and that in part comes down to thinking about what kind of metadata sits and what sort of inf cultural information is available as people are accessing um, accessing data sets from different places and brings us to um, thinking a little bit more about the provenance of indigenous data and what i'm going to talk about here is um, the traditional knowledge labels uh, so this is an initiative that um, you can find at localcontext.org but has emerged over the last 10 years or so um, developed by Professor Jane Anderson from NYU in collaboration and partnership with Indigenous um, communities, primarily in North America. And these 18 traditional knowledge labels are machine readable digital tags that establish provenance for Indigenous data, um, in part by creating a durable and persistent cultural metadata, and they enhance community control um, and definition, in part because they are uh, can only be delivered by the communities themselves while the icon remains stable um, the cultural metadata associated with the icon is customizable by the community and this is in um, uh, either in use or being discussed with uh, a large number of users uh, a large number of indigenous user institutions um, across the globe in a variety of countries and just to give you an example of um, what it looks like in practice, uh, this was the uh, online catalog, a record for uh, within the, sitting within the Library of Congress uh, for the first ever uh, recordings of um, songs uh, that were made on, on tribal lands. And the, the tribe in question here is the Pasmaquari, you can see it highlighted there. But outside of the name, there's not really anything that connects um, the people to this uh, this material. And after the, the tribe engaged with the Library of Congress around this project, um, you now see what the, uh, the record looks like. And so there's a, a much richer description of uh, cultural traditional knowledge associated with the associated with the, um, the songs. Um, it creates a much richer record for the public, given that they can still access this. And you can see sitting there, um, really visible on the record, uh, the traditional knowledge labels, which the Pasmaquoddy tribe has placed on this material. So one, uh, the first label being attribution, talks about um, the connection back to the Pasmaquoddy themselves. Uh, outreach refers to um, the fact that they're happy for this material to be used by the public for outreach purposes, but it should also only be used for non-commercial purposes. And this becomes the, um, the outward facing record and aspect, um, you know, within the Library of Congress, but there's also things that need to happen in the background to allow this to happen. And one of those things is uh, changes within the digital infrastructure. So um, within the MARC record, uh, there are now space for the uh, traditional lodge labels to be recognized and similarly in the JSON file where um, there's now a place in the database for um, traditional or field field in there for traditional knowledge labels so this means that any item within the Library of Congress could now have a traditional knowledge label um, attached to it 
uh, alongside this change. There was also the addition of the traditional knowledge labels to the rights advisory and a recognition of them as the first rights. So they sit there um, alongside the intellectual property right, which is held by the Peabody Museum um, at Harvard University. And so the traditional knowledge labels um, obviously associated with cultural heritage information and traditional knowledge. And I've been working with Jane Anderson over the last two years to apply this model to genomic data generated from genetic resources. And so we've been working through a project here in Aotearoa uh, to develop and apply them. And we have six um, initial biocultural labels, a provenance label, talks the same things as, as attribution, uh, consent verified, um, labels that indicate uh, desire by communities that might be open to future collaboration or being open to commercialization activities, uh, a label that recognizes multiple communities where there might be a range of different communities that have an interest in a particular genetic resource, um, and also a research use, um, research use only label. And so the, the labels themselves and you know, the section was around provenance and that's one of the things which the, the labels are doing um, is creating a, a, a sort of a provenance story that connects it back to these um, traditional communities. But it also does a couple of other things in the sense that there are protocols, uh, traditional protocols associated with material which um, ought to be respected um, by public accessing the data and that's reflected in some of the labels down the bottom that might be restricted to men or women or applied at particular seasons of the year. And there's also labels that refer to what purposes are being permissioned into the future. And you know, as we talked about with the outreach label or the non-commercialization label. And this, um, this work has led to uh, the need to start thinking about where these labels or where this provenance information would sit within you know the whole you know variety of databases and um, systems across the across the world and so that's led us to um, initiating a project with the ieee to create a standard or a recommended practice for the provenance of indigenous people's data and this activity has um, got underway in mid 2020 and will probably take a, a few years before we can uh, generate uh, the information that can then be applied as a standard across the globe. And so the last thing that I wanted to um, uh, cover in this session was a bit that then uh, moves the thinking a little bit along from uh, the questions of indigenous data and a little bit of thinking about um, algorithms and, and artificial intelligence. And so this uh, next session is based on a bit of work we've just completed around Māori perspectives on automated decision making. And that's been part of a, a project being done by the Digital Council thinking about trust and AI. And so there were two key activities that we did for this project. One was um, a literature review and the other was uh, we held an, uh, an expert workshop. And the, some of the key points that emerged from those two activities. One was that the literature of Māori data sovereignty or Indigenous data sovereignty more generally primarily focuses on data access and governance. Um, there are some comments made on appropriate use and analysis, but limited discussion about algorithms and, or automated decision making. Um, and this generally reflects all, all the things that are said generally reflect concerns that are expressed by minorities and other um, jurisdictions. A couple of key points is that uh, data itself can't really be separated from algorithms and you know that they are uh, connected to each other in terms of uh, what they what they create and that the algorithms themselves can't be separated from the processes or the systems within which they operate. And so when bias exists within historic data sets that's going to be reflected in the outputs of, a, of an algorithm and if there's bias within the system that's using the algorithm, that's also going to be reinforced and reflected through through the use of that algorithm. 
and so the uh, as a part of the project we um, looked at the Māori values that are being used in the context of Māori data sovereignty or the, you know, the Māori principles for Māori data sovereignty um, which are promoted by Te Manurarunga but also used by the data iwi leaders group so this is a tribal chairs forum um, that has a uh, working group focused on issues of data and um, we've used that to frame some of the thinking that emerged from here too. So when thinking about whanaungatang and obligations, it's important to increase transparency about the use or proposed uses of automated decision-making. Effective partnership and participation means con conversations about the ethical aspects of the technology happen at the same pace as the use of the technology or the development of the technology itself. Um, it's important to create audit processes or design checks uh, so that we can work out which automated decision making systems are, are good and which ones are, are effective and less effective. Um, and that should be set or done using criteria developed by Māori. And you know, this kind of goes down to that need to calibrate the likely impact of any kind of automated decision making systems. In terms of rangatira tango authority, we need a strong Māori regulatory body to support the ongoing governance uh, and use of automated decision-making systems. Um, this is often in the context of uh, application uh, across government by government departments. Māori governance across ADM is necessary to mitigate harm, stigmatisation and inequitable outcomes. So part of that is we're creating a range of control mechanisms that can apply across the different kind of situ situational context which we'll find ourselves. So whether those are jurisdictional ones or whether those are temporal ones. Um, in terms of kotei tango collective benefit, building Māori capability and automated decision-making, machine learning and AI will like to improve outcomes and potential benefits. Uh, there are opportunities to ensure to our Māori, the Māori worldview and Māori values frame problem definition and the way that automated decision making is applied. And need to be thinking about or, or recognising that bias um, exists and how do you work with that? And if we can create more transparency about the bias and be selective in the way it's used to further collaborative approaches, then um, that might... Uh, address some of the problem issues associated with it. Uh, in terms of the whakapapa or the relationships, you know, what, is the, um, what is the basis of a decision? What are the different kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, decision or, or, or points where information has been drawn together or applied or logics applied to come up with a decision which comes out the back end of the algorithm? Um, just, you know, recognising that historical data um, is often being generated from an inequitable um, process and that creates, that can create inequitable outcomes and that there needs to be more diverse range of characteristics and relationships within the data sets applied within automated decision making to improve um, outcomes and uh, trust in those systems. In terms of manakitanga, Māori need to understand the data that informs their decision making, those made by um, automated decision making processes. There's limited examples of uh, really good trust relationships, this is often between agencies and Māori communities, with most of the agencies expecting Māori to trust them, um, but not get, having much trust in Māori themselves. And, you know, this can only be addressed by meaningful participation and partnership. And in terms of kaitiaki tangle guardianship, data within automated decision-making uh, systems is from people and therefore has this sort of life essence or a modi. Um, it ought to be uh, automated decision-making algorithms ought to be viewed as both living, requiring uh, guardianship and relational to their connecting a network of obligations and relationships, and that needs to be appropriately maintained. Um, and the analogy being used here is you don't leave a carving alone in the rain. So all the effort that goes into place in terms of um, creating that 
um, tone or creating that artifact, um, you then just don't um, let it waste away. So, you know, so it's just thinking about in the context of algorithms, how kaitiaki or guardians could be responsible for ensuring that algorithms themselves can withstand changes in context over time to ensure that they're, um, they continue to be fit for purpose. And so out of that project, there were a range of recommendations that we put forward um, based on Māori perspectives on automated decision-making. There's a need to build um, cap capability and capacity around Māori data and uh, digital capacity within both Māori communities and across networks of Māori practitioners. Uh, we need to develop robust equity assessment protocols for uh, algorithms, to assess algorithms. We need to ensure Māori participation in institutional algorithm self-assessment processes, so often the internal processes being used um, as people are uh, developing and, and implementing algorithms uh, don't involve the people on which the algorithms are going to be applied to. And that, you know, that needs to be thought about, particularly during self-assessment processes. To support collaborative partnership and project governance and development and use of algorithms, uh, it'll be useful to create a Māori values framework and um, guidelines based on cultural protocols to support the design, development, use and maintenance of automated decision-making tools. And also having the chance to explore um, Māori use cases. So, you know, much of the uh, critique of AI automated decision-making is the negative aspects um, which can be generated from them, uh, which contribute to, you know, uh, continued colonization of um, indigenous communities. But there's also this element where the tools themselves, if you have the right sort of data, if you have the right sort of um, kind of question, if you have the right sort of design, uh, could be applied to enhance language and enhance um, the use of, of traditional knowledge in, in, you know, in contemporary environments. And that becomes one of the things to you know, really consider and think about going forward, is it's not just about decolonizing data or decolonizing um, algorithms, it's also what is the potential there to create indigenous um, artificial intelligence and what might that look like? And so, you know, through, there are people um, around the world, including, um, you know, this, um, there's this uh, website here, which is bringing together indigenous um, researchers and communities to discuss what kinds of protocols might inform artificial intelligence. And, you know, as well, we're working on a new project um, here in New Zealand called Tikanga Technology, which is also has a component that's thinking about um, what does it mean to indigenize artificial intelligence. So just in closing, um, really uh, highlighting um, you know, indigenous data sovereignty is about indigenous control of indigenous data. And, but it's, that's not the end in and of itself. Um, you know, the control of data allows then indigenous peoples to control the sorts of narratives that are generated um, about them and by them. And that's about those communities being um, self-determining and that they are able to um, contribute to the, the realization of their own aspirations. And those things sit behind, you know, really the activities of the Global Indigenous Data Alliance um, and the discussions about decolonizing data, about Indigenous data sovereignty. And um, that these things need to be thought about in the context of um, ethics as it relates to data and ethics as it relates to um, AI. So, Noreira uh, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Kato. Um, I hope you can take um, the thoughts and ideas from this and have them add to, to what you learn through this course. <laughs>